Holy Gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ according to St. Matthew, the fifth chapter. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the, up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter kind, all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The gospel of our Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Well, I'm going to try something new. Some of you will have to look at the back of me. But I'll try to do this like story time, right? And I can turn around, see? I can swing around. This works. At least it works for today. Jesus says, blessed are they. I have known about the Beatitudes since early childhood. When I began to be a reader, my mom and dad got me these books on the Beatitudes and the Lord's Prayer and the Ten Commandments. And they were kind of small books with pictures and uh, they were accordion styles. So you could fold them over leaf by leaf or you could open them up all together. The Matthew 5 chapter passage uh, tended to seem out of reach to me as a child. It was poetic, but I really didn't understand what it meant. And as an adult, I really can't miss the meaning. I think Jesus preached it to inspire hope. He's preaching to his disciples specifically. But even when I read the Beatitudes today, I'm really left undone at first brush. First of all, there is really nothing appealing to me about the challenge to be poor or meek or hungering or thirsting because they seem so diametrically at odds with my all too present ego. And the call to be merciful and peacemaking seems more or less un uh, out of reach and unattainable. Less appealing to me, however, is the prospect of pain that Jesus promises. Poverty, sorrowing, hunger and thirst again, suffering injustice, getting bullied and persecuted, being reviled and accused of all kinds of evil, or as it says in the First Nations version, hunted down, mistreated, lied about, spoken against, and looked down on with scorn and contempt. I mean, I suppose that's the cost of discipleship, right? But I'm not feeling too happy or blessed right now. <laughs> I... I'm not feeling that state of blessedness that Jesus talks about. They just don't seem like good options to me. Whenever I hear or read them, my heart doesn't rise up and respond, oh yeah, I'll have more of that, please. This is exactly what I've been looking for all my life long. I'm more like, Jesus, do you have another list? <laughs> my parents were good Lutherans. And they also raised me to say my prayers at bedtime. Likely you are familiar with the form of prayer that they taught, which begins, Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Whoa, wait a minute. You mean I could die before I wake? I'm three years old and just getting started here, and you're telling me I could die in my sleep? It scared the everlasting aspirations out of me. 
That's not what's printed in my notes. <laughs> I've never been a fan of inevitable death, and I've never been a fan of pain either. Really not in any form, not suffering or illness or physical pain, or any bullying or emotional pain, none of it. And think about how we try to protect us, ourselves and others, and especially our children from this kind of pain. I'm a three-month preemie back in the day, and as a result of a long hospitalization and incubation and isolation, I was pretty sick through my preteen pre -teen years. So I was susceptible, more susceptible than most kids. All, all kids, you know, get viruses all the time. But I seemed to attract them and all kinds of sickness. I was in bed a lot through my young life. And especially I remember the ear aches and how utterly painful they were. And I remember writhing in bed and wanting to know why this was happening to me. Finally, uh, uh, it, it ended up with a hospitalization and a mastoidectomy. And that seemed to, to do the trick. My parents held me back from school uh, in terms of the age group that I was in. And my mom worried over me in a way that made me feel like I needed to be the parent for her. I needed to watch out for her well-being. So all this to say, I think I do know something about pain, and mainly that I don't like it. I think about two panels of a Peanuts cartoon. In the first panel, Lucy is telling Charlie Brown to buck up. A little pain never hurt anybody, Charlie Brown. In the second panel, Charlie Brown comes to this realization and, get, and answers her right back, pain hurts. Pain hurts. When Jesus invites me to pain, my first response is pretty much, well, thanks, but no, no, th no thanks. I, I don't think I'll try slop today. <clears throat> I much prefer the gospel of come to Jesus and everything is going to be wonderful and all your needs are going to be met. Like John 10.10, 10, I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. I'll take a big helping of abundant life meat and potatoes, please. You can fill my plate. That would be great. I avoid or tend to avoid the gospel of try God and God will try you. Or of laying down my life or carrying the cross. It's just this natural bent I have. Luther calls it a heart turned in on itself. Here, have some vegetables of tears and suffering. They'll be good for you. No, thank you, I reply. So, there you have it. You know now that I'm afraid of pain and I'm afraid of death. And in Bible terms, I'm afraid of death and the sting of death. If being blessed as described in the Beatitudes costs me the kind of pain that Jesus projects, then I think I'm happy to settle for something a little bit less, but maybe not so far down as cursed, but a little bit less than blessed. But contradicting my fears this morning, and it's not in your readings, but it certainly came into my mind, St. Paul instructs the Roman Christians that we've died already. Don't you know, Paul asks, that is, that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. Therefore, we've been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So really what Paul is telling them is, you've died already. You don't have to fear death anymore. You've already experienced death in the waters of baptism. Though we still on the, live on this mortal plane and have a mortal human body, we've passed from death to life already. And the life that we live now is hidden with Christ in God in heaven. Oh, how I wish I could really comprehend this. See it perfectly and more clearly. It would save me a lot of time and trouble. Imagine with me, please, what it would be like and what it should be like to 
pass through physical death into new Christ life right here, right now. <clears throat> For one thing, nobody could hurt you because you've already died. Try as they might, people can't offend or even trigger. They uh, can't make you bleed. Gone and long forgotten are any last vestiges of self-protection or shyness or reclusion. You live in a natural state of vulnerability. No shame. No hiding. For another thing, you see everyone differently. Relational harmony described in Isaiah 11 is a reality for you. The wolf shall live with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the lion and the fat link together, and a little child shall lead them. In other words, nobody's an enemy, and everybody is a friend. Finally, all that would exist for you would be love, pure love. And for all my confessed resistance, that I'm admitting about the Beatitudes, and I know they're beloved by so many, and I don't mean to diminish that in any way. For all my resistance, I do like love. You know, if you know the reference, for all my rage, rage, and not going gently into that good night, I do like love. I do like being loved, receiving love, sharing love. Paul has a love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, starting with love is patient, love is kind. It's just as poetic. Read through new eyes, the Beatitudes, I think, are a kind of love chapter to his disciples, from Jesus to his disciples and to us. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Love, Jesus begins is poverty of spirit. It gladly empties itself of time and resources for the good of others. Paul says, love does not insist on its own way. Blessed are those who mourn. Love can be sad or sorrowful at the experience of loss or rejection, but even so, it seeks for new opportunities and inroads into humans' hearts. Paul says, love never fails, never gives up, always keeps trying. Blessed are the meek, love is polite, open, not self-serving, always has the other person's best in mind. Paul says love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Relentless love works on behalf of the disenfranchised and the oppressed for the cause of truth, fairness, justice, the right. Paul says, love rejoices in the truth. Blessed are the merciful. In spite of any wrongdoing or offense, love still is inviting and accepting and welcoming and inclusive and non-judgmental. Paul says, love doesn't rejoice in wrongdoing. In other words, it keeps no record of people's wrongs. Blessed are the pure in heart. Love is your own pure, true self the way God created and redeemed you. Paul says love abides, meaning love is all there is and love is eternal. Blessed are the peacemakers. Love values relationships and builds bridges and offers forgiveness and genuine and lasting reconciliation between people. Paul says love is not irritable or resentful. He also says love believes all things and hopes all things. Then here's the one Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and all, and for all its good, you know that man, uh, love can be misunderstood and resisted and um, sometimes even violently opposed. Yet the cost is momentary and by comparison, <clears throat> it really doesn't hold the candle to love's eternal fullness. Paul says love is long suffering. Love is kind. He also says love bears and endures all things. So at first brush, I reject the Beatitudes as unachievable and impossible. But on second brush, I can definitely buy into the Beatitudes as a call to love. Because love is always available and accessible and achievable. 
Anyone, anywhere, in any condition, at any time, in any place can make the choice to love. Just look how you love one another here at Agnes Day. Just look how you love. You practice love and your various gifts come out and get expressed. Some of you are peacemakers and relationship specialists. Some of you are concerned for the environment and for justice. Some of you know how to sit and weep with other people through their suffering. Some of you know the exact right kind of kindness to share with someone else. Which of the Beatitudes do you personally identify with? Are you a peacemaker? Are you poor in spirit and love giving out to others? Are you a mercy giver? Do you hunger and thirst for justice in terms of people or the world around you, creation? Are you willing to stand, withstand opposition for the sake of others? Do you mourn identifying with other people's sorrows? They're all beautiful gifts. And altogether, I'm looking at a room full of Jesus Beatitudes. Here's the deal. When you choose to love, even just a little bit of love, you simply discover yourself quite naturally and without and effortlessly fulfilling the scriptures that we read today. Blessed are the poor in spirit and so on. Because love is the greatest gift of life into which, by baptism, we're continually born and reborn. And that's really good news. Amen.